Hey everyone, welcome back to Calculus 2. This is going to be lecture 22 of the course, and in this one we're going to discuss improper integrals. Alright, so let's go ahead and get started. And we'll call this section 3.7 improper integrals. Okay, so by the word, when we say the word improper, what do we mean? We just mean kind of unusual. Right? There's, uh, I don't think there's anything improper. Although these do technically fall outside of what we would call a, an integral typically, right? So the definition of a definite integral, right? So let's talk this through. The definition of a definite integral, right? A to B, F of X, DX, okay? Uh, require has there's a couple requirements here. First of all, uh, it's going to require the interval a b to be finite. Right. So a and b are assumed to be you know finite numbers when we're talking about a definite integral. Okay. <clears throat> um, another thing that we'll be in violation of here briefly is the fundamental theorem of calculus. So if you remember back to the fundamental theorem of calculus, this is going to require f to be continuous on a, b. Okay, so two things here of, of, of key import for this section, right? First thing is that when we are talking about integrating over, you know, when we're talking about a definite integral, the, the region of integration has to be finite, right? That's just by definition, right? And if you think back to how we constructed uh, those definite integrals, we use rectangle, rectangles and, you know, a partition um, and et cetera, et cetera. And so all of that mechanism requires um, a b to be finite right the second thing is that we said hey look you know to use the fundamental theorem of calculus it's going to require f to be continuous on a b right meaning there's no discontinuities there's no gap there's no um no no uh, you know sort of infinite uh uh you know gaps in the in the function or some you know asymptotic behavior or any of that on f over the region of, of integration, right? So those two pieces are uh, what we typically run into when we're dealing with improper integrals. So in this section, we're going to study uh, basically a, pr a procedure for evaluating integrals that do not satisfy these two requirements, okay? That do not satisfy these two requirements. So, so we're going to look at integrals Like the first, the first thing we'll look at is situations like this, where you've got <clears throat> a to infinity of f of x dx, or <clears throat> infinity to b of f of x dx, you know, or negative infinity to infinity of f of x dx, right? Those kinds of things. So that's the first thing we'll look at, first kind of improper integral, and then the second kind of improper integral is going to be ones where there's a certain number of discontinuities over the region of integration, right? So <clears throat> what if I want to, what if I have this function, you know, um, it looks like this, and I want to integrate from A to B. So meaning I want to know what this area is, but I have asymptotic behavior right in the middle of the region. How can we deal with that? You know, how can we uh, integrate function like this? <clears throat> okay, when you have an infinite discontinuity here. Normally, we would say, "Hey, this is outside of you know what we can do," but thinking of it as an improper integral is going to introduce a, a range of techniques. Okay. Okay. So these kinds of things are called. This is what we mean when we say improper integral.
You know, and so sometimes when people hear the word improper, they think, oh, bad. No, they're not bad. They're actually extremely fascinating and <laughs> some of the more interesting integrals you're ever going to come across. So, um, okay, so let's talk about this one. Uh, let's, let's start with this idea. So let's consider um, the function f of x equals 1 over x squared. Okay, and let's just uh, plot this thing on the positive x-axis. So it kind of comes down and looks like this, right? Right, as x gets larger, then the ratio gets smaller, 1 over x squared. All right, so let's say we've got 1 here, and then we've got some value b out here. Okay, now this area here <clears throat> can be captured by the integral uh, 1 to b, whatever b happens to be, of 1 over x squared dx. All right, we could quickly do this. This is negative 1 over x from 1 up to b, and so we get negative 1 over b plus 1 over 1, right? And so we can clean all that up, and this looks like 1 minus 1 over b, right? That's the area, right? So we can interpret this, 1 minus 1 over b, we can interpret this as the area between 1 and b of this graph above, okay? All right. Now what happens when we take the limit of this b as b goes to infinity? Okay. Right, so what happens when we move this this upper bound of integration off to infinity? Well, Let's look, right? Let's do that exercise. <clears throat> and so this is gonna kind of set up the first type of improper integral and how to deal with it. So if I if I look at this one to infinity of one over x squared dx, one nice way to write this would be to instead of writing infinity as the upper bound, because we can't in order to evaluate this integral, we're gonna have to plug those upper bounds into, you know, whatever function we get as, you know, uh, when we calculate the integral, but we can't plug infinity into any expression, right? So what we can do instead is we can convert this to one up to b and write the limit as b goes to infinity in front, okay? Because we, we're never gonna be able to plug infinity in, but we can plug b in and we can evaluate an expression involving b as b goes to infinity, All right? So that's gonna be kind of our approach to dealing with integrals like of like this, right? So this is going to be equal to <clears throat> the limit as b goes to infinity of, right? We calculated this integral just a moment ago. This is 1 minus 1 over b, right? Plugging all the bounds in and doing all the work. All right now, what happens to this limit, right? Now, as b goes to infinity, what happens here? Well, this is going to be equal to basically one minus one over infinity, so one minus zero, so one, okay? So this tells, what this tells us this tells us that the area under the curve of f of x equals one over x squared uh, between well, I'll say on the interval one to positive infinity is equal to one. Now that's kind of remarkable, isn't it? Right, that's kind of remarkable. If this is the first time you're seeing this, you may be saying to yourself, what? Hold on a second. All right, so you've got this function, f of x equals one over x squared. Right, one is going to be on here somewhere. Whether that's a good picture or not, I don't know. But right, so what this basically says is that look, the area from one all the way up to positive infinity is a finite number. That is remarkable in many, many ways. Right, you're taking an infinite, like this goes all the way up to infinity, right? 
forever in that direction, right? And forever in that direction, the curve is non-zero. It's not like it becomes zero at like two million or something. It's always non-zero. It's always above zero. It's greater than zero, right? But it but it shrinks very very rapidly as x starts to get large, right? The amount of area you're adding at each interval, at each unit, as you move off to infinity, is a tiny, tiny area, and that that what basically is happening here is that the the rate of decrease of this of the area that you're adding is rapid enough that the whole area converges to not only a finite number but the number one <laughs> the air so this area is a finite number and is equal to one okay so that is amazing so this this is uh, you know an infinitely long in, uh, interval but you know and this curve is greater than zero along that entire interval uh, but uh, the entire area is equal to one okay so this is kind of why I say these improper integrals are some of the most interesting integrals you're going to come across okay so let's let's go ahead and kind of define uh, how, how well let's write down how to deal with improper integrals with infinite integration limits okay and so there's really three variations uh, improper integrals with infinite uh, integration limits Right, so there's kind of three scenarios that can occur, right? The first one is what we just looked at, right? Where you've got some finite lower integration limit, but an infinite upper integration limit, right? And that's the case that we just looked at. And so the way we want to deal with that is we want to take the limit as B approaches infinity of the integral from A to B of the function, right? Again, just to reiterate, the reason we do it this way is because we can't plug infinity into an expression and evaluate it. And when we do it, when we evaluate a definite integral, that's what we have to do, right? We have to plug b into the into the integral, and then we have to plug a in. We subtract the two to come up with the area, right? We can't plug infinity in. We can plug b in, and then we can take the limit as b approaches infinity, All right? So that's what we just did. The other, uh, another scenario that can occur, of course, is when the lower bound is infinite, like so. And we're gonna run the same operation there. We're gonna say, okay, we can't, you know, we can't evaluate negative infinity in any expression. So we'll take the limit as a goes to negative infinity of the, fun of the integral from a to b. Kind of the reverse operation, right? And then the other scenario is, you know, where you have both upper and lower uh, integration bounds are infinite, right? So I have something like this, right? I want to know the, basically I want to sum across the entire real number line, right, for some function. Well, then we, we kind of break it into two pieces. We consider this guy from negative infinity up to some finite value c plus the other the other end right infinity from c up to infinity of f of x okay and then each of these of course we use one and two for three right so basically this this piece this integral here is basically case two, we got negative infinity up to some value, negative infinity up to some value. This one over here is case one, so you got some value c up to infinity, some value up to infinity, right? So basically we can break the range down into two pieces and then sum the two pieces separately using one and two. Okay, perfect. Let's do another example. We kind of did an example, like a motivating example. Let's do another one where we use this technique. Let's evaluate 
the integral from 1 up to infinity of 1 over x dx. So similar to the previous example, not exactly the same though. I think you'll see they're quite different in reality. So integral of 1 over x dx, that's going to be equal to the limit as b goes to infinity of the integral from 1 up to b of 1 over x dx. And that's the limit as b goes to infinity of, now what is what is the um, integral here, 1 over x? Well, that's the natural log of x, isn't it? Natural log of x, and then that's from 1 up to b. And so we have the limit as b goes to infinity of, and this would be natural log of b minus natural log of 1. And the natural log of 1 is just 0, so this is the limit as b goes to infinity of the natural log of b. Okay, and so we know that the natural log uh, will increase as, as b increases, and so this is going to be infinite. Okay, so in this case, this infinite, this limit, this integral here produces an area that is infinite. Right, so it's interesting. So that it's interesting that this area is infinite while the previous example was finite. Okay. Now the previous example was 1 over x squared, wasn't it? All right, so let's kind of write this out here. So 1 is 1 and that uh, when x is equal to 2, 1 over x squared is a fourth, right? So it's down here. And when x is 3, 1 over x squared is a ninth, so it shrinks very, very rapidly here. Okay, so this is f of x equals 1 over x squared. Now the one we just looked at was 1 over x, so it would be 1, 1, and then one half, and then one third. Uh, so it's one third, it's about there. And then one fourth, right? So this one is, I mean, they, they look so similar, right? Now clearly, um, we all know, right? Just because we can kind of reason about this. This one is, going to be quite quite a bit closer to the x-axis at each tick, right? You can kind of see that in the early days, but if we were to blow this up, really zoom in on this, we would see that this one is going to get closer to the x-axis much, much quicker than this one, right? Like imagine the value of 50,000 in here. 50,000, 1 over 50,000 squared is a lot smaller than 1 over 50,000, right? So clearly this is going to go to zero much, much quicker than this one. Right, and it's that rate of decrease, that rate of approach to zero, which makes this area finite, or this area is equal to one, whereas this area is infinite. It's that it's that rate of approach, what we'll actually call convergence, in the next couple sections when we start looking at this closer. It's that convergence rate that really kind of determines uh, whether you end up with a finite area or an infinite area. All right? For now, it's going to have to remain a little bit of a mystery. Right? You're going to we have to delve into convergence and talk about series and sequence and all that. And then even still, there'll be more work to do to really get at this at this uh, issue. But suffice it to say, this is no fluke. Right? The area truly is infinite under this curve, whereas it's finite under this curve. They look an awful lot alike. And you might say to yourself, when I get infinitely far out on this, it doesn't matter. They're both really small, but it does matter. <laughs> Remarkable. OK. Very good. Um, let's take another look. Let's take another example here. Let's evaluate the integral from 0 up to infinity of e to the negative x. Okay, so similar setup, 0 to infinity, 
e to the negative x dx. Let's pull in a limit here. We'll let uh, b go to infinity. So this will be 0 up to b of e to the negative x dx. Okay. And so it's the limit as b goes to infinity of, now what's this integral? Well, it's negative e to the negative x from 0 up to b. So the limit as b goes to infinity of, now what do we get here? We get e, negative e to the negative b, and then minus negative e to the zero power, so that'd be like minus a negative minus plus one, right? Now what happens here? Well, uh, as b goes to infinity, this negative e goes to negative infinity. Right, so e to the negative infinity, this whole, this whole thing's heading to zero, isn't it? Yeah, so this is gonna be equal to zero plus one, which is just one. So here again, we've got a finite area, even though our integral uh, integration range is infinite. <clears throat> very, very cool. Um, let's take a look at this one. So from zero up to infinity, and then the integral is one over x squared plus one. Okay, so we'll set it up just like before. From zero up to infinity, one over x squared plus one. Let's bring in a limit. Limit as b goes to infinity of the integral from zero up to b, one over x squared plus one. Now, what is this integral? Well, this is uh, u squared plus a squared, isn't it? One over u, u squared plus a squared. So that means this is the arc tangent, right? So this is arc tangent of x from zero up to b. Okay. And so um, this would be the limit as b goes to infinity of arctan of b minus arctan of zero. Okay, now what are these things? Well, arctan of zero is zero. Arctan of b, well, that guy there heads off to pi over two, actually. And so this would be equal to the limit as b goes to infinity of the arctangent of b which is pi over two, okay. All right, so that one, so what do we remember kind of like what this, what this means here? So let's, let's, let's draw in these functions here because these are kind of weird functions. So one over x squared kind of looks like this, right? It sort of looks like this. It kind of comes down like so. This is of course zero. Right, so we're interested in the in integral of this entire region here. This is one over x squared plus one. Okay, <clears throat> and so yeah, you can see here that obviously when x is equal to zero, this is equal to one, right, so that's one. And then as x grows, the ratio shrinks down. So sort of similar to kind of like what we saw with the one over x squared, except the plus one uh, makes this a little bit different. Okay, um, and then when we integrated here, uh, we ended up with the arc tangent. Now, if, if you recall what the arc tangent looks like, right, the arc tangent looks like this. So probably people remember what the the tangent looks like, but the arc tangent is basically going to be the tangent sort of on its side, isn't it? Right. So this would be negative pi over two here. And so we're going to have sort of this asymptotic horizontal asymptotes here. And so the arc tangent is going to go like this. Right, so as you know, you can see here, <clears throat> as b goes to infinity, right, as you know, the value of that you're evaluating arc tan, it goes to infinity, then this is going to tend towards this horizontal asymptote of pi over 2. Right, and the implication, of course, is that 
that is also the area under the curve of f of x equals 1 over x squared plus 1. Okay, so kind of a uh, kind of a, a tricky one to think about, um, but yeah, very very interesting. You can see sort of the connections between uh, some of these guys. So it's interesting. This this value here is pi over two, right under this in a, under this under the curve of this function. It's pi over two. It's a very important uh, constant in the in the world of trigonometry, and obviously it comes from. Uh, the fact that this integral is arctan. Okay. All right. Um, what about an example where the upper and lower bounds are infinite? Let's do one of those. We haven't talked about one of those yet. So let's evaluate the integral from negative infinity up to positive infinity of e to the x divided by 1 plus e to the 2x. Okay, now let's see what this looks like. Okay, so if I've got my x, y axis like this, this guy kind of comes up to a peak and then heads back down. Totally symmetrical about the y axis. Um, and so what we want to know is, you know, what is this area under the curve all the way from negative infinity to positive infinity? Is it finite? Is it infinite? Let's find out. <clears throat> okay. So <clears throat> we'll start by just, let's rewrite the integral here, and then we're going to have to break it up, aren't we? We're going to follow the example that we, or sorry, follow the rule that we kind of established early on. So we're going to you know, find some value in the middle. Zero is the most convenient value. We'll say this is the integral from negative infinity to zero of e to the x over 1 plus e to the 2x plus the integral from zero to positive infinity of e to the x over 1 plus e to the 2x. Okay, so from negative infinity up to positive infinity, we just broke it into two pieces. And now what we're going to do is we're going to plug in some, because you know we can never plug in negative infinity or infinity, so we're going to plug in you know, an a and a b instead. Okay, and so this is going to be the limit <clears throat> as b, um, sorry, is Oh, sorry. Uh, one, one second. I wrote this down wrong. This is going to be the limit as a goes to negative infinity of the integral from 0 to a of e to the x 1 plus e to the 2x dx <clears throat> plus the limit as b goes to positive infinity of 0 up to b of e to the x over 1 plus e to the 2x dx. Okay, right? So I'm just kind of plugging those two pieces in. <clears throat> and then we can evaluate these integrals, right? So let's see, this is a to negative infinity. And so what do we get here? Well, um, there's a little bit of work to be done here. Um, you can use u substitutions here. And basically, what we'll find is that this integral here is the arctangent of e to the x. And that's from a up to 0. Okay, just take, you, you can pull this off to the side and just take a second and, and see that. And then this one over here, this is the limit as b goes to infinity. And over here, it's also the arctangent, obviously. Right? It's the same function. Okay, and then this is from 0 up to b. Okay. <clears throat> and so, have that, we can plug in our endpoints here. Okay, and so what we get is the limit as a goes to infinity. Now, what is this? Well, when we plug in e to the 0, we get uh, this pi over 4. And then it's minus the arc tangent of e to the a power. Okay, and then plus over here the limit as b goes to infinity. And when we plug that in, we get again the arc tangent of e to the b power minus pi over 4. Okay. 
<clears throat> so no problem there. And so <clears throat> we can kind of pull some of this apart. Let's just do that quick. So we've got pi over four on the outside here, minus this first limit. Uh, plus this limit, b to infinity of arc tan e to the b, and then of course minus pi over 4 on the outside there. So these two are obviously going to undo each other. All right, but what's happening in the middle here? <clears throat> um, so what's going to happen in the middle here? Well, um, looking at this first one, right, so a is going to infinity. Oh, actually, I think I, I think I dropped one of these. One of these is going to negative. This one's going to negative infinity. Sorry. Okay, so that's going to negative infinity. <clears throat> so notice here for this first one. So note, let's kind of write down what's going on here because this can be a little bit tricky. So e to the a, right? What does this do? Well, this is going to go to e to the negative infinity, right? So as a verges the negative infinity, this becomes e to the negative infinity, which is going to be equal to zero, which goes to zero, we should say, as a goes to negative infinity. Okay, and so what does that mean? All right, so this piece here is going to zero, which means the arctan is going to zero as well, right? So you've got the arctan of e to the a is going to the arc tan of 0, right, which is, hold on one second, <clears throat> which is equal to, let's see here, which is going to go to pi over 2. Oh, sorry, it goes to 0, sorry. Okay. Right, so sorry about that. So basically, you just have to kind of reason this through. So e to the a, as a goes to a negative infinity, e to the a goes to e to the negative infinity, which is zero, right? Goes to zero. So that means this term here, this piece here goes to zero. Arctan, when arctan goes to zero, this whole thing is going to go to zero. So that whole thing goes to zero. Okay, now what about this other piece? Well, <clears throat> e to the b, so notice b is going to infinity. So e to the b is going to e to the infinity, infinite power, which is obviously going to be valued, going towards infinity as well. So that means that the arctan of e to the b is going to arctan of, you know, basically infinity, right? It's growing to it without bound. And so we saw that this is going to go to pi over 2. All right, we saw that on the previous on the previous uh, page, right? Let's remember what that looks like, right? So here's arctan's function, right? As as we as b grows without infinity, say that's b, then the value of arctan gets closer and closer to pi over two. <clears throat> so that's all we're saying here, as well. So this is going to pi over two. Okay, so this is all kind of side calculations. And so that means that we basically have pi over 4 minus 0 plus pi over 2 minus pi over 4. So the whole thing is pi over 2, isn't it? Okay. The whole thing basically is equal to pi over 2. So let's recap that. So that basically means that this integral, negative infinity to positive infinity, of e to the x over 1 plus e to the 2x is pi over 2. Nice. Very nice. Okay, so that's kind of the <clears throat> what we've established. And then this function, of course, you know, ha it looks a lot like a bell shaped um, distribution, like from probability theory, if you've seen those. A little bit like the normal distribution, actually. Right, so it kind of looks like this. And what we're saying is that this curve, um, the area above the x-axis between this curve on the entire real line, is pi over two. All right. Okay.
Perfect, so that's a good place to stop that. Now let's switch gears to the other type of improper integral that we can come across. All right, so the second type of improper integral. Uh, so remember, this is one that has an infinite discontinuity at or between the limits of integration. So let's write that down. The second basic type of uh, improper integral um, is one that has an infinite discontinuity at or between uh, the limits of integration. Okay, so this is one, this is the second kind we want to look at, right? And so, um, you know, the, there's a couple of examples we could whip up. So here's, here's an example, All right? So say we want to integrate from zero up to some number, we'll just say one, right? And you got some function that is asymptotic at zero. Well, what you're asking, what you're being asked to do is to calculate the area from basically this asymptote up to one, right? So this is an asymp asymptotic at x equals zero, right? So this integral has an infinite discontinuity at the lower bound. Okay, it's infinite discontinuity at the lower bound. So basically what that means is we were to try to plug in this lower bound, we would get some kind of an infinite discontinuity. Okay, so that's a problem, right? The fundamental theorem of algebra says that we can't do this because this this function, sorry, the fundamental theorem of calculus says we can't do this because this function is not continuous on the interval zero to one, in particular at the end point. Okay, and of course you can imagine the other scenario where the end point has a discontinuity, you know, would look just, you know, kind of kind of the reverse. Right, so if I want to calculate the integral from a up to zero in this case, I got a problem with that upper limit. All right, we've got a discontinuity here. Okay. All right. So that being the case, uh, then then the third type is where you've got an infinite discontinuity anywhere in between. Right. And so that's kind of the example we led with. You know, maybe you've got something like this. And we've got a function that does normal things on the outside here, kind of maybe it comes down and hugs the x-axis. And I've got a region from A to B, and in between it, I've got this asymptote. Right, so asymptotic here. Okay, so how to deal with this? What do we do? Well, here's what we're gonna do. So let's just push this up a tish here. So here's how we'll approach it. So how to approach these. So the first thing, right, so if f is continuous on the interval a up to b, and has you know uh, an infinite discontinuity at b, right? Hence the the half open interval. So if f is continuous on the interval a up to, but not including b, and has an infinite discontinuity at b, right? Then here's what we're going to do: the integral from a to b of f of x dx, what we're gonna do is we're gonna say that's equal to the limit as c approaches b from the left of the integral from a up to c of f of x dx. Okay, so think about it like this. Here's the picture, right? We've got asymptotic behavior. Here's your 
A, it's as and the function is asymptotic at B, right? It has a vertical asymptote at B. So what we're going to do is we're going to inject some other value C, and we're going to calculate this area, and then we're going to let C approach B from the left, right? So obviously this area is going to grow, uh, and this limit will capture the value. Does that make sense? Hopefully that makes sense, right? Um, that's the idea, right? So we'll calculate from A up to just C in the normal way, and then we'll let C approach B. We'll let that upper bound approach B, which is a, you know, some kind of an asymptote, vertical asymptote. Okay, all right, we'll do an example in a second. Let's just bang out the other two cases. They're all kind of similar, right? It's more just writing them down formally. But the second situation would be is, would be when F, if, you know, if F is continuous, on the half open interval from A up to B and including B, right? So half open and has an infinite discontinuity at A, right? Then, you know, we're going to do the same thing. So here we've got A up to B of F of X DX, right? A is problematic, so we're going to take the limit as some other value C approaches A from the right of the limit of the integral from C up to B. Okay. Right, so this is the same idea as what we just talked about. It's just on the other side, right? So I've got some function, right? Some function, this is X, this is my F of X. Right now, I'd like to integrate from A to B, right? But A is a is an asymptote, a, hor a vertical asymptote. Um, so, i.e., the function is has an infinite discontinuity at A. So, what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to drop some C in here, and I'm going to calculate this integral. Then, what I'm going to do is take the limit as C approaches A, right? And so, as I do that the integration region, the, the area will be kind of blown up to the true area of the whole region from A to B. Okay, so sim it's exactly the same as item one. It's just now it's just literally just flipped. It's the lower bound that's problematic now. And then, so then the third case is, well, what if you have something in the middle, right? If F is continuous, on the interval a b uh, except for some c right right so some c inside that interval that isn't the endpoint right uh, where f has some an infinite discontinuity so if f is continuous on the interval a b except for some c and b where F has an infinite discontinuity. Well, then you know we're going to do something real similar, right? So we've got the integral from a to b of f of x dx, and so what we're going to do is we're going to break it apart. We're just going to break it apart into the integral from a to c of f of x dx plus the integral from c to b of f of x dx. Right, now c is the c is the problem area, right? So basically we're gonna use one and two here. Let me explicitly write it down. So this would be like plus the equal to the limit as c, let's see, or as well, I'm gonna think of another variable here, so a, we'll just put D. D approaches C from the, you know, from the um, lower lower side of the integral from A to D of f of x dx plus the limit as <laughs> let's see f approaches C from the 
right hand side of f up to b of f of x dx. Okay, so I'm just kind of breaking that up. I mean, this other piece probably didn't need to be stated. You're going to treat each of these basically like this is case one, this is case two, just add them up, right? But you can see the idea here, right? Uh, a and B are fine. It's this in-between point where you have an asymptote where you're going to have to do this kind of limiting evaluation, right? You're going to have to evaluate using a limit at those points. Okay. All right. Very good. Let's do an example of, of these. Let's do some examples. Make sure we understand how this works. It's relatively straightforward, but though you can get lost in the details. It is possible to get lost in the details here. Okay, so uh, let's evaluate uh, this integral. 0 up to 1 of 1 over the cubed root of x. Okay, so the issue here is that this uh, function, 1 over the cubed root of x, has an infinite discontinuity at zero, right? You can see that just by looking at this, that if I plug in zero directly, I get one over infinity, right? So uh, we have a problem, okay? So let's see what how we can deal with this. So the integral from zero up to one of one over the cubed root of x dx um, is equal to it's equal to, right, so we can we, we need to deal with this lower bound, that's the problem. So the limit as b approaches zero from the right hand side of the integral from b up to one of one over the cubed root of x. Okay, let's draw a picture just to make sure that this is really clear, like what's happening. All right, so this is kind of looks like this. Right now, here's your zero, and maybe your one is somewhere up here. This isn't an exact drawing, right? But you can see that as we get close to zero, um, you know, this denominator is going to grow, right? And as you know, when x is 200 billion or something, the cube root of 200 billion, one divided by that number is a very large number, right? And so this val the value of this integrand is growing without bound as we get closer and closer to zero. So we have to deal with that. Right, that would what we, that would mean is there's a discontinuity there, and so this is the setup, right? We we have to deal with this problematic lower bound, and so the way we do it is we swap in a b, and we're going to take the limit as that bound heads towards the problematic point, right? Because we can't do direct evaluation there, so we're going to have to use a limit argument, okay? And so the limit as b approaches zero from the right. Now, can we integrate this? Let's write it slightly differently. It's instead, let's write x to the negative one third power. That's a really easy limit or easy integral to deal with, right? The limit as b goes to zero from the right hand side of this is going to be what x to the two thirds. So it's negative one third plus three thirds. So two thirds over two thirds. And it's going to be from b up to one. And what do we get here? We get three halves, and then it's basically one to the two thirds, just one minus b to the two thirds. Okay, now what happens here? Well, we can see what happens, right? The three halves is just going to be there for, for sure. Uh, and then you're going to have a one. And then what happens when b goes to zero? Well, this term goes to zero. There we go. Okay, so here's a here's an example of uh, you know we've got a finite integration region, but on the lower end of the region the values do tend towards infinity, right? But even given that, uh, we still can see that the area is a finite value two thirds or sorry three halves three halves. Very cool. Let's do an example, um, another example. This is a good one. Evaluate the integral from 0 up to 2 of 1 over x cubed. Okay, so here again, 
right? At zero, we have a discontinuity. The function has uh, basically an asymptote at zero, vertical asymptote, very similar to the previous example, actually. So the integral from zero to two of one over x cubed dx is equal to the limit as b goes to zero, right, from the right-hand side, because we would be going from two down to zero, so right-hand direction of b up to 2, and this will write it as x to the negative third power. Okay, so the limit as b goes to 0 from the right of, can we integrate this? Sure, it's negative 1 over 2x squared from b up to 2. And what do we get here? We get negative one eighth minus negative one over two b squared. All right, very good. Now what happens here? Well, the negative one eighth uh, is gonna be negative one eighth. Um, but then what happens over here? Well, as b goes to zero, this ratio explodes, right? It gets larger and larger, and so this one is infinite. All right, very good. Okay, so that means that this integral is infinite, has an infinite value. Okay. Um, how about we finish up with kind of a harder case? Let's see, um, let me get a new sheet here. We'll do one more example. And this is, uh, this is an example where we've got a doubly improper integral. So the integral is doubly improper. So let's evaluate the integral from zero up to infinity of one over the square root of x times x plus one. Okay, so this is improper in the sense that, uh, well, we've got an infinite upper integration limit, okay? Um, we also have, you know, a problem at zero, right? So we have a problem at zero, meaning this actually this lower bound is problematic as well, right? Here we have an infinite discontinuity. Okay, so we've kind of got two problems here. So to do this, uh, to evaluate this, uh, we will split the integral uh, just at a convenient point. And we'll say x equals 1. It's convenient. Okay, just because it's convenient to evaluate things at 1. So, so the integral from 0 up to infinity of 1 over the square root of x times x plus 1 dx. Okay, this is going to be equal to the integral from 0 up to 1 of 1 over square root of x times x plus 1 plus the integral from 1 up to infinity of one over square root of x times x plus one dx, right? So basically just taking that range zero to one or zero to infinity and breaking it apart into two pieces. Now, in this piece, the problem is the infinite discontinuity at zero, okay? So that's the problem over here, which we can deal with using the techniques we just learned. And then on this piece, the problem is not an infinite discontinuity, the problem is an infinite upper integration limit. Okay, so for this one, we'll use the techniques we learned sort of at the beginning of the section. Right, so two different techniques that are gonna be at play here. Okay, so we'll set it up. Right, so here we're gonna need to deal with this lower bound. So we're gonna set the limit of B as B approaches uh, zero. Right, we have to approach this value from the right. Right, okay, so that's that one. This is just a straight, strict application, you know, basically setting up examples like the two we just did for this, right? Because that's the problem on the lower side of the range. On the upper side of the range, 
um, the, the problem is this upper bound. So what we're going to do is we're going to set the limit as c goes to infinity from 1 up to c. Okay. Right, so you know, notice this is a kind of a hybrid of the cases we've ex examined so far. Right, we've got uh, kind of two different things going on here. So it's doubly improper. All right, <clears throat> very good. Now can we evaluate this? You bet we can. I've done this one ahead of time um, just because I didn't want people to get lost in the details of the actual integrand. But this integrand here can be figured found using um, A's and U's, right? So this is, tech, turns out this is equal to the uh, two times the arc tangent of the square root of x. Okay, so you can spend a couple, you can spend a little time like sorting that out, but that's what you'll find, okay? So it's from b up to one. And so it's the same thing over here. Limit as c goes to infinity of two times the arc tangent of the square root of x. Uh, over here it's one up to c. All right, and so we can plug everything in here and plug it all in. And so what we're going to get here is 2 times the arc tangent of the square root of 1. So 2 times the arc tangent of 1. Um, and then it's going to be minus the limit as b approaches 0 of twice the arc tangent of the square root of b. Okay. So that's this. So that's this one. So twice the arc tangent of one, just plug in that upper bound. And I and I pulled that outside the limit as I kind of did that. So I could, you know, technically like I guess you would evaluate this first and it'd be the limit of all of that. But you know, knowing that B is not a part of this, I just pulled that out as, you know, the same step. Okay. So then it's plus this other piece. All right, now this other piece is the limit as C goes to infinity of twice arc tan of square root of c. Like so. Um, and then minus this other piece. Minus twice the arc tangent of the square root of 1, which again is just 1. Okay, so that is perfect. All right, um, so then what are all of these values. Okay, so it turns out that, wait one second, let me make sure I'm looking at this right. Turns out that, you know, so this one um, is pi over 2. Uh, sorry, it's 2 times pi over 4. I should be really thorough here. Arctangent of 1 is pi over 4. And over here, it's the same thing, right? So this is also going to be 2 times pi over 4, right? So, so pi, arc tangent of 1 is pi over 4 times 2, right? So those two are both the same, right? And you're subtracting, so they're going to disappear, okay? Um, and then what's happening inside here? Well, here, uh, b is going to 0, so that means 2 times the arc tangent of 0, right? And so this is actually going to go to 0, here. Okay. And what about this one? So this one is going to zero. What's going to happen here? So as c goes to infinity in square root of c goes to infinity as well. So this would be two times the arc tangent evaluated very far out on the right. And, and we know that this tends towards pi over two, right? We saw that. Right? Keep in mind, I should draw this just because this is such an unfamiliar function for people. Right, so this is that arc tangent function. So you have negative pi over two and positive pi over two, and the arc tangent goes like this, right? So as x goes out to positive infinity, we get ever closer to pi over two. Right, so this guy is heading to pi over two. Oh, sorry, it's twice pi over two actually, right? Because of the two. So all in, what we have here is two times pi over four for the first one minus 0 for the second one, plus 2 times pi over 2 for the 
for this third piece, and then this last one is minus 2 times pi over 4. All right, so obviously you've got pi over 2, minus pi over 2, and then in the middle you've got just a, just a pi, right? So this whole thing is equal to pi. So this area is uh, finite and equal to pi. Right, so just to bring that all into focus here, zero, the inf integral from 0 to infinity of 1 over square root of x times x plus 1 is equal to pi. Remarkable. Okay, so that's pretty pretty cool. All right, and so I think that'll do it for improper integrals. Okay, so in the next section, when we get back together, we'll have uh, we'll be switching gears and heading into section four of calculus two, which is going to be. Uh, we're going to leave behind integration and differentiation for a little bit. We're going to talk about infinite uh, series and sequences and convergence, and it's going to be a, kind of a different world. So, uh, very cool. I know, you know, like uh, calculus two is one of those courses, like typically five credits uh, as an undergraduate course, and it is um, a brutal long uh, list of of topics. And it fortunately it does shift gears a couple of times. And so this is a, a kind of a, uh, I, I find that this is a, a sort of refreshing, uh, uh, you know, gear shift or like direction change a little bit. I mean, we still will be using integrals and all of and derivatives and whatnot, but uh, it's a little bit of a different kind of mathematical thinking than what we've been using to this point in the course. So, all right, we'll see you all in the next one. Take care.